Hello everyone, thank you for joining our digital Horses to Horsepower program here at the California State Railroad Museum. We're located along the Sacramento River and just down the way from California's State Capitol Building. And we're a part of Old Sacramento State Historic Park, which is part of the network of 280 California State Parks spread throughout the state. Together, we work to protect and share our state's most valuable natural and cultural resources. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the culture, heritage, and people of Sacramento. We acknowledge that we are standing on the tribal lands of Sacramento's indigenous people, and that Sacramento is the ancestral homeland of the Nisenan and Valley or Plains Miwok tribes. They were the original stewards of this land and have lived here since time immemorial. We recognize and honor the indigenous people of the Sacramento area, both those who came before and those who are still here, as we discuss how westward travel and settlement and movement across the Transcontinental Railroad changed California and impacted its populations. In 1869, there was an event that forever changed life in America. That was the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad that for the first time connected up the east and the west coast of our nation. Now the Transcontinental Railroad, it wasn't the first railroad that we had here in the United States. If you see from this map in red, all of these lines were before 1869 and they're concentrated just on the eastern half of our country. Nothing was stretching out over here to California and the west coast. So the Transcontinental Railroad was made possible by two railroad companies that built towards one another. And that line is this line right here. So starting here in Sacramento, we had the Central Pacific Railroad that built out to the east. They built this section right here. And starting in Omaha, Nebraska, we had the Union Pacific Railroad that built out to the west, and they built this section right here. Now these two met up in Promontory, Utah in 1869 to complete the railroad. And this took about six years and an estimated 20,000 railroad workers to make it possible. In the next five video stations, you'll learn how the Transcontinental Railroad was planned, how it was built, and some of the lasting impacts that it's had on our country. And as you follow along, I invite all of you to think about the challenges that the people in this time faced. And what do you think your lives might have been like if you were alive during this time? Here at the museum, we say that our lives are made of railroad stories because we like to tell the story of the railroad through the stories of people. So the first person that you'll learn about today is a man named Theodore Judah, whose dream for this transcontinental railroad changed history. Have you ever had a dream or have you just wanted to do something so badly no one was going to stop you? Well, that's how Theodore Judah felt about building the transcontinental railroad. It was his dream to build it, and no one was going to stop him from doing so. But what is the Transcontinental Railroad, and why was Judah's dream of building it so important? Well, for one thing, California had just had a gold rush, and people from all over were coming to California to try and find their fortune. But at the time, there were only three ways you could get here. The first way was to walk or ride a horse all the way across the entire country. This could take anywhere from six to eight months, and it was very difficult to travel this way. Many people didn't survive the trip west. Another way you could get to California was to board a boat in New York and sail all the way down around the bottom of South America and back up to California. This trip also took about six months. The final way you could get here was by boarding a boat in New York, sailing down to Panama, walking through the jungles of Panama, and then boarding another ship and sailing back up to California. This way only took about three months, but people often caught deadly diseases such as malaria and yellow fever. This created the opportunity for Judah's dream of the Transcontinental Railroad, which would allow people to cross the country in days rather than months. From the time Theodore Judah was a child, he loved railroads. In fact, when he was just 14 years old, he was helping to run a railroad in New York. When he turned 28, he got an offer to help build a railroad in California from Sacramento to Folsom. He quickly accepted this job offer and he and his wife Anna left for California. Although this project didn't last long, it was his opportunity to start working on getting the Transcontinental Railroad built. Once in California, Judah started to do a survey of his desired route 
from Sacramento through the Sierra Nevada mountains. Judah's wife, Anna, often accompanied him during these surveying trips. She helped keep him organized and even helped sketch the surveyed land. Eventually, after about a year of surveying, Judah found a route through the Sierra Nevada mountains at Dutch Flat. Judah went to the Congress in Washington, D.C. to try and get funding to build this railroad. But, unfortunately, this attempt was unsuccessful due to many different opinions on where this route should actually be. Upon returning to California, he went to San Francisco to look for investors, but again was turned away as interest lied in shipping rather than trains. Eventually, Judah received help from four wealthy businessmen in Sacramento, named Leland Stanford, Charles Crocker, Collis Huntington, and Mark Hopkins. They would later be nicknamed the Big Four, or the Associates. They provided Judah with money so that he could complete his survey of the Sierra Nevada mountains, as well as make a map of his preferred route. Now, armed with this knowledge and this map, Judah and Anna went back to Congress in Washington, D.C. once again to convince them again to build the Transcontinental Railroad. And this time in July of 1862, Judah was able to convince Congress of the need of the Transcontinental Railroad, and Abraham Lincoln signed it into law. Lincoln saw Judah's dream of the Transcontinental Railroad as a way of unifying the nation during the Civil War, a time of great division. Eventually, Judah and the Big Four split up because of a disagreement with Judah about how the project should be run. Judah, not wanting to give up on his dream, went back to the East Coast once again to look for new help completing the project. Unfortunately, on the ship ride over to the East Coast, he contracted yellow fever and passed away shortly thereafter in New York. He never got to see his dream completed, but nevertheless, his dream of the Transcontinental Railroad changed the history of California and the country forever. In that last station, you saw photos and videos of the Sierra Nevada mountains. This is the mountain range that runs between California and Nevada. It's about 400 miles long and 70 miles across. And it's made up of primarily granites, like this rock right here. Its peaks range from 11,000 up to 14,000 feet tall. And from right here in Sacramento, it's about 35 miles to the beginning of the Sierra Nevada foothills. Now, unlike a roller coaster that can go up and down, trains can't go up a steep incline. It has to stay relatively flat. So the challenge was to find a passage through these mountains flat enough for a locomotive to be able to pass through. And if it came up to a mountain, well, it couldn't go over it, so they would have to find a way to go through it. And to make his dream of the Transcontinental Railroad a reality, Theodore Judah did the physically challenging and time-consuming work of hiking up through the mountains and surveying. He also got the right people on his team with the support of the Big Four, and he didn't give up when his first pitch for funding was rejected. It is a shame that Theodore Judah didn't live to see his dream completed, but his story now lives on here at the museum. And now that the railroad had funding and a plan, that left the next greater challenge of actually building it. So in our next station, we'll move on to learn about the Chinese railroad workers who made it possible for the Central Pacific Railroad to pass through all of that granite up in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Building a railroad is tough, hard work, and the Central Pacific had the difficult task of building a railroad up and over the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Chinese immigrants made up 90% of the workforce. They graded roads, bored tunnel through solid rock, laid track, and built bridges. They had to cut down trees and clear dense brush. They cut away land in some places and filled it in in other places. And they did it all by hand because there were no steam shovels, power drills, or tunneling machines. Instead, they used picks and shovels, wheelbarrows, carts, and horses. The men worked 10 hours per day, six days per week. 
work in the Sierra was the toughest of all because of how brutal the Sierra winters were. The winter of 1866-1867 brought more than 40 snowstorms. 40. The snow was so deep, the men working up there built snow tunnels to get around it, but they kept working. The railroad ran 24-hour shifts with Chinese workers chipping and blasting away at the solid granite rock. The railroad hired more than 10,000 Chinese men to do this work. Have you ever tried to break a rock? If you have, you know it's a really difficult thing to do. Well, imagine chipping away at a mountain built of rock and building a tunnel big enough for a train to get through. From 1865 to 1867, Chinese railroad workers built 15 tunnels. The most difficult was tunnel number six, or summit tunnel. This tunnel was 1,695 feet long. That's almost five football fields lined up end to end. The Chinese worked day and night. Using a star drill, something similar to this, one man would hold it in place while another pounded it with a big heavy hammer. And when he hit it with the hammer, the other man would turn it a quarter turn. Hammer, turn, hammer, turn, hammer, turn, all day until they made a hole that was about two and a half feet deep. When they had several of these holes, they put in black blasting powder and then they packed it with straw and mud and lit a fuse. Boom! It blasted away the rock and the workers would carry away the rocks in baskets and wheelbarrows. Day after day after day after day they did this. Now what do you think it would be like to work in a tunnel like that? It'd be cold, it would be dark and very loud as you blasted deeper and deeper into the mountain. Your supervisor would be yelling at you to work harder, and the air would be so dusty and confined that it would be very hard to breathe. It was very difficult work. Many of the men died in blasting accidents or in avalanches in the mountains, but the Chinese continued to work hard, and they finished the tunnels in the summer of 1868. By the way, the snow was so bad the Central Pacific built 37 miles of snow sheds, like the one that we have here in the museum. Some people called that the longest barn in the world. Well, for all this work, the railroad paid Chinese workers less than white workers. By June of 1867, Chinese earned about $35 a month, which equals out to about $600 in today's dollars. White workers made more, plus the railroad paid for their food and lodging. Chinese workers wanted $40 a month and to work eight hours a day instead of 10. When the railroad refused, 5,000 workers went on strike. It was the largest strike of its time. This was very bad timing for the Central Pacific because they had a very strict time schedule to meet. Time was money, and the more tracks they built, the more money they made still. They refused to pay the Chinese what they asked for, and they cut off their food supply. After a week without food, the Chinese went back to work without the raise in pay that they had demanded. But they made their point. They stood up for themselves, and it was a sign of their collective strength. The Chinese proved to be very hardworking and dependable. They had to deal with extreme prejudice from other white workers and from supervisors. But they eventually earned the respect of Stanford, Huntington, Crocker, and Hopkins, the big four, who could not have built the railroad without them. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad was a historic accomplishment, which would not have been possible without the Chinese railroad workers who made up 90% of the Central Pacific Railroad's workforce. As you heard, they worked harder and more dangerous jobs for less money. 
They also face discrimination in many forms, physically, financially, as well as legally. During his governor's inaugural address in 1862, Leland Stanford, who was mentioned earlier as a member of the Big Four, called the Chinese an inferior race and proposed using the power of the state's constitution to block their entrance into California. Stanford later changed his views of the Chinese workers after he saw their importance to the completion of the railroad. However, his earlier comments and policy recommendations did come to be a reality in America 20 years later. After the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, thousands of Chinese workers moved on to other positions. Some who had money saved for the journey returned to China. Others moved into new fields, such as mining, manufacturing, logging, and agriculture. And many thousands continued to work for the railroads throughout the West and Canada in skilled positions. As the number of Chinese immigrants grew in the workforce and they became more successful, negative attitudes towards them spread across the country due to continued racist cultural views. They were blamed for lowering wages and creating poor economic conditions for white workers. This led to a National Chinese Exclusion Act passed in 1882, which blocked the immigration of Chinese laborers for 10 years and prevented them from becoming citizens. While it was only meant to last for 10 years, Chinese Exclusion Acts were continued all the way up until 1943, which is 61 years later. Because we strive to be a museum of, by, and for all people, we consulted with the Chinese community when planning and building our exhibit about the Chinese railroad workers, including speaking with some of their direct descendants. The oral family histories that are passed down from generation through generation tell an important story. The hard work, achievements, and perseverance of the Chinese railroad workers is a story of pride and accomplishment. In our next station, we're gonna take a look back to that day in 1869 when the Transcontinental Railroad was finally brought together and completed and some of those celebrations that took place across the country. And as we look at these celebrations, it's important that we remember the people and all of the hard work that went in to make this day possible. The time had finally arrived. The Central Pacific Railroad building from the west and the Union Pacific Railroad building from the east were finally going to meet. After six long years of hard work, the two railroads planned to meet at Promontory Summit in Utah on May 8, 1869. Although originally scheduled for May 8, the ceremony didn't happen until two days later on May 10. Why, you ask? How could you be late to such an important day? Well, 300 of Durant's Union Pacific workers stopped and uncoupled Durant's private car in Wyoming. They claimed they had not been paid for their work and demanded $200,000. Durant arranged to have $50,000 wired to the site as a down payment. The men released the car and Durant continued on his way. The cities of San Francisco and Sa Sacramento went forward with their planned celebration on May 8th and held a second celebration with the rest of the country on May 10th. Railroad executives, workers, photographers, journalists, and other onlookers gathered in promontory for the Golden Spike ceremony. Theodore Judah's dream the leadership of the Big Four and the labor of tens of thousands of workers had all led to this moment, the completion of the nation's first transcontinental railroad. One hour before the ceremony began, Irish workers representing the Union Pacific and Chinese workers representing the Central Pacific laid the two final rails in place for the ceremony. The only thing missing were the spikes. Spikes, usually made of iron, hold the metal rails to the wooden ties. For this special occasion, four ceremonial spikes were made. Nevada donated a silver spike. Arizona donated an iron spike laid in silver and gold. San Francisco newspaper, the newsletter, donated a gold spike. And California businessman, David Hughes, donated an engraved gold spike. Hughes made two nearly identical spikes. He offered one to Leland Stanford to take to the ceremony, and he kept the other one for himself. Unlike Stanford's, the spike Hughes kept was the correct date of the ceremony, engraved May 10th. This spike is on display here at the California State Railroad Museum. Now, back at Promontory. At the site, there was no stage, music, or way of addressing the hundreds of onlookers. 
Reports of the actual sequence of events vary due to noise and crowding. After several speeches, Leland Stanford and Thomas Durant drove the final spikes that joined the two railroads. Telegraphers kept an anxious nation informed. At 12.47 p.m. promontory time, the ceremonial spikes were tapped into place by a silver mallet. Telegraphers wired the spikes so that the country could celebrate together. This act signified another national first, the first transcontinental telegraph message. The Morse code message D-O-N-E was sent out across the country. Done. The railroad was complete. The country could finally enjoy coast-to-coast -coast transportation and communication. After the official ceremony, photographer A.J. Russell captured the moment in his famous photograph titled East and West, Shaking Hands at Laying the Last Rail. It shows the Central Pacific Railroad's chief engineer, Samuel Montague, and the Union Pacific's Granville Dodge shaking hands. Take a moment to observe this photo. What emotions do you think these men may have been feeling? Many people dreamed of what a transcontinental railroad would mean for the country. Think about the benefits of quick transportation from coast to coast. If you remember, prior to the railroad, cross-country travel would take four to six months. With the transcontinental railroad, people were able to travel across the country in seven days and seven nights. Does this sound like an improvement to you? Of course it does. D-O-N-E was the Morse code message sent by telegraph across the country. But the innovation and work were far from done because now people and goods could cross the country in just seven days and seven nights, which was a huge improvement from the four to six months that it took before. And passengers in the east were very excited to take this much faster and safer journey out to the west. But passengers found that these early journeys were often uncomfortable, loud, dirty, and cramped. So inventors got to work. There was opportunity and money to be made improving the comfort and safety of the rail journey, as well as improving the systems that supported the railroads and allowed them to run. Female and black American inventors made their marks on railroad history. And in our next station, we'll take a look at a couple of these inventors and the contributions that they made to the railroad. The Transcontinental Railroad changed the speed and efficiency of travel in America, but it was riddled with imperfections regarding safety and comfort. These imperfections provided an opportunity for savvy forward thinkers to make their mark in the world of innovation. Inventors came from all around with groundbreaking ideas, which made the lives of train passengers safer and more comfortable. And some of these innovations you and I still enjoy today. Now first, I want you to imagine that you are a train conductor and you are in a train headed down the tracks and suddenly your train stops. Now, you can't move the train. There must be something wrong with it. So, you know that there's another train headed on your way shortly. And if they don't know that you're stranded and helpless in the tracks, there is going to be a terrible collision. So what do you do? Well, you probably want to send them a message to alert them of your sticky situation. But in the early days of the railroad, sending tr messages between trains just wasn't a possibility, which would make for dangerous tracks when a train made an unexpected stop. That changed when a man named Granville Woods entered the scene. Granville Woods was born April 23rd, 1856. He was a black man living in the United States of America. Now he worked really hard for an education in electrical theory and mechanical engineering, often working full time while attending college classes, but most of his education was actually self-taught. Woods had a long career in the railroad. First, he worked as a fireman, then he worked as an engineer, and then a train conductor. But what he really wanted to do was to become a private inventor. He eventually invented what is called the induction telegraph system. Now, the induction telegraph system was a communication system which used electricity from existing telegraph lines which ran parallel to the tracks. This made it possible to send messages between moving cars and rail stations. And for the first time ever, trains were able to communicate their location 
any unexpected stops and accidents in real time. It's sort of like sending a text message, but using Morse code. Now that we don't have to worry too much about getting into a collision, we can sit back and enjoy the ride. But after several hours of traveling, the wooden seats are getting awfully uncomfortable. Now I gotta tell you, traveling by train wasn't too plush in the early days with hard seats and hard beds. That slowly changed with time, but one woman really took comfort to the next level. Her name was Olive Wetzel Dennis. She was a female engineer born November 20th, 1885. Now some of the comforts that you and I still enjoy today on trains and airplanes come from Olive Dennis's ideas for comfortable travel. Olive Dennis traveled the rails for several months to try to get an idea of what a passenger would need to really make for an enjoyable ride. Her ideas for things like reclining seats with footrests, air conditioned cars, lighter meals, dimmable overhead lights, and simplified timetables, which would make it possible for travelers to see when their trains were departing and arriving. All these improvements made for a much higher quality traveling experience. Now, of course, nothing is ever 100% perfect and we can strive for perfection in all the things we do, which means that you can be innovators too. So as you go about your day, I want you to think, what would you do to make the railroad more enjoyable? If you have ever had an idea for an invention or a way that you think something could be done better, don't give up on it because perhaps you are the person that invents something that changes the world or improves other people's lives. We have some big challenges out there and we could use more creative thinkers like all of you. That last station was about inventions for the railroad, but there are all kinds of industries that could use new inventions and exciting ideas. We have one more invention to talk about today that's changed the way that we eat. And no, it's not Uber Eats, I'm talking about the refrigerator car, which is what we are standing inside of right now. And you can see behind me where they would load in big blocks of ice that would keep fruits and vegetables nice and cool as they're transported by rail. Today, we're pretty lucky because when we go to a restaurant or a grocery store, we have so many options for the different types of foods that we can buy. And we're not limited to eat just the foods that can be grown in the area that we live in but we could eat foods from other parts of the country or even brought in from other parts of the world. But this wasn't always possible. So in our last station, we'll learn how this invention of the refrigerator car with the support from the railroad changed the way that people ate across the country and transformed California into the agricultural center that it is today. At our last stop on the tour, we're going to talk about two things that had a powerful impact for the railroad in America, the refrigerator car and California agriculture. After the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, hundreds of people could travel by train from New York to California in about seven days. What do you think California could send back to the East Coast? It wouldn't make much sense to send back empty train cars. How about produce? In California, the milder climates allow us to grow lots of produce year-round. Fresh fruits and vegetables like lettuce, broccoli, and oranges could be all packed into these empty boxcars and travel by rail back east. This opened the market for California farmers to feed the nation. After a week in a boxcar, the produce wouldn't be so fresh. Imagine eating a salad that was made from lettuce that was sitting out in your countertop for a week. It would get wilty, slimy, and no amount of ranch dressing would fix it. The refrigerator car would fix this problem. In the late 1870s, the refrigerator cars were introduced to the railroad. These are box cars cooled by big blocks of ice cut from frozen ponds in the Sierra Nevada mountains. The ice would help California produce stay fresh a little longer. You're all used to it now, but really think about how this would change everything in the 1870s. Now let's pretend that we're visiting New York City in the 1870s. It's winter time and we're looking for a restaurant for dinner. Most of the menus that you would read would offer preserved produce like spinach or maybe peaches. 
The restaurant next door visited the farmer's market at the railroad station. Their menu has salad with fresh lettuce, tomatoes, along with fresh strawberries and cream for dessert. I would want to eat fresh produce over canned. This was a game changer. You're used to it now, but think about how that changed everything in the 1870s. Today, you could travel anywhere in America, even the world, and find fresh fruits and vegetables. The refrigerator car was a pretty good system, but still, things change and improve over time. In comes the story of our next innovator, Frederick Jones. Frederick was the child of a black mother and white father. He lost both his parents by the time he was nine years old. What Frederick was able to do over his career without the support of parents or even a formal education is truly amazing. As a young man, he held a variety of technical jobs, a foreman at a garage, a mechanical engineer, and a sergeant in World War I working as an electrician. He taught himself mechanical engineering and picked up his other skills on the job. When he was 20, he earned his engineering license. He and a partner successfully developed an electric refrigerator and established the U.S. Thermal Control Company, later called Thermoking. By the 1930s, Frederick's designs of a large electric refrigeration unit were widely being used in homes, trucks, and railroad cars. Food could be transported over long distances without worrying about melting ice. His inventions opened the door to shipping foods all around the world and started the rise of portable frozen meals. Frederick patented 60 inventions over his career. 40 of them were related to refrigeration. The next time you visit your refrigerator, pour yourself a glass of ice water and make a toast to the great contributions of Frederick Jones. Today, California is an agricultural powerhouse. We're living during California's second gold rush. If you add up the value of all the gold that was mined in California over the past 160 years, it would be worth about $25 billion. Now that's a lot of cash, but in 2019 alone, California produced over $50 billion worth of agriculture. Modern agriculture was made possible by the railroad and the inventions that refrigerated and transported our foods. Thank you for joining us on this journey from the wild idea of a transcontinental railroad to how it was built to some of the impacts that we can still see today, even when we look in our refrigerators. The railroads, they weren't built around our towns. Our towns were built around the railroads. And all of us are part of a railroad story, whether you knew it or not. But hopefully now you all know a little bit more about your own railroad story.